To some extent, the health and safety of our demo democracy may depend on it. That is setting the record straight again and again when presented with the lie that January 6th was anything other than a barbaric assault on our capital and on the peaceful transfer of power. So when Donald Trump seeks to cast the rioters he incited that day as peaceful and patriotic and deserving of full pardons for the good of our democracy, that can not stand. And so as defendants grow increasingly emboldened, just, uh, judges overseeing more than 1,200 such cases in Washington federal court are starting to push back. From a recent ruling by a Republican-appointed judge, quote, the court is accustomed to defendants who refuse to accept that they did anything wrong. But in my 37 years on the bench, I cannot recall a time when such meritless justifications of criminal activity have gone mainstream. I've been dismayed to see distortions and outright falsehoods seep into the public consciousness. I've been shocked to watch some public figures try to rewrite history, claiming rioters behaved in an orderly fashion, like ordinary tourists, or martyrizing convicted January 6th defendants as political prisoners, or even, incredibly, as hostages, end quote. That is all preposterous, but the court fears that such destructive, misguided rhetoric could presage further danger to our country, end quote. All right, we're back with uh, Tim Hafey and Ben Rhodes. Uh, guys, thanks for being here. Uh, Tim, let's just talk about this for a second. It, again, there have been people who have been on the wrong side of, of judgments. There are people who think people are wrongfully convicted. But this has reached a new level. It's not just Donald Trump and Marjorie Taylor Greene and a bunch of assorted others. Um, uh, Elise Stefanik was on Meet the Press uh, uh, a few weeks ago uh, when, when, when Kristen Welker asked her about these, these, uh, these defendants. Uh, and those who have been convicted, she referred to them as hostages. Uh, the, why are these judges so concerned by what this one judge calls the mainstreaming of this weirdness? Because, Ali, we've seen what rhetoric translates into on the ground. There's no better and more emphatic example of that than January 6th, when the former president says, we have to fight like hell or we're not going to have a country anymore. People take that seriously. So when he and others are calling these people political prisoners or hostages, this is not simply rhetorical. There are a lot of people in this country who take that seriously and who are prepared to act on it. L let's talk for a minute about Royce Lambert, right? There is no jurist in Washington, D.C. or around the country who has more credibility and, and ultimate respect from lawyers than Judge Lambert, appointed by President Reagan, 37 years on the bench. He is no liberal or no part of some political plot to get at the former president. He is as reliably conservative and, frankly, credible as a judge over his long history as anyone. So when he, yet another example of a conservative voice of, with great credibility, coming out and challenging this rhetoric, it's a little bit like Bill Barr saying to the president, what you're saying to the country is bullshit, right? When it comes from people like them, who are otherwise potentially on policy matters aligned with the former president, it has more credibility. So it's dangerous. Judge Lambert is calling it out, as are other judges, because it has consequences. And again, consider the credibility of the messenger really, really significant here. Uh, ben, I want to just play for you something that J.D. Vance, uh, Senator, said this week on, uh, on, on this week on ABC yesterday about what he would have done if he were the vice president of the United States uh, back on January 6th. Let's listen together. If I had been vice president, I would have told the states like Pennsylvania, Georgia and so many others that we needed to have multiple slates of electors. And I think the U.S. Congress should have fought over it from there. That is the legitimate way to deal with an election that a lot of folks, including me, think had a lot of problems in 2020. I think that's what we should have done. I mean, that's wild. Um, that D J.D. Vance, a sitting United States senator, says something that is against the law, that is against the Electoral College Act, um, and, and that, by the way, seemed to have turned into a crime in the effort to do that. I, I guess that's the problem with the mainstreaming. This is not J.D. Vance saying something about how he might have wished Donald Trump won. He's literally laying out a prescription as if it's reasonable for the lack of acceptance of the outcome of an election, a legitimate election. 
Yeah, I mean, there's no bottom. Uh, and I think there's something really important that we have to focus on here, which is there's this effort, I think, on the right in this country to cast this as some event that happened in the past, and why can people just kind of move on and get past it? This is still happening. <laughs> this is the platform of the people, Donald Trump and the people around him, that want to come back into power. These are the forces that want to undermine and unravel American democracy. That is a Republican senator saying on national television that he doesn't believe in the constitutional order and the peaceful transfer of power. That's what's at stake, not in the past, but in the future, right? Because as these judges are warning, the message from Trump, too, is kind of wink, wink, wink. Maybe I'll come in, I'll pardon everybody. Like, we're, we're going to be behaving like the kinds of other countries that we've seen in the past where a mob can overrun the parliament and you can have an extrajudicial process to keep or hold power. And once you start dis discarding, like, the most fundamental norms in this country, like an election in which there were clearly no significant allegations of fraud, an election can be overturned because people don't like the results, then, then how do you get democracy back? And I think that that's what's so important. It's both about remembering and telling the story of what happened on January 6th, but it's also about communicating that this is about what's going to happen in the future, because these people feel no remorse over what happened on January 6th. They think nothing was wrong with it. Uh, and this is not just Donald Trump. This is across the mainstream of the Republican Party. And, and until we were able to move past a period in which those types of figures are willing to discard American democracy, we're kind of still living in this emergency period where every day is kind of a January 7th uh, uh, d d you know, d d decision about what kind of country do we want to live in.